global population will likely decline in the next generation or two. What will that mean for cities? We'll talk about that today on Builders Live. Hey, I'm Chris Wink. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Technically, the news organization with a community of technologists and entrepreneurs. Uh, we expect around 2100 to the globe, for the global population to be declining or at least slowing. And that's already taking place in different countries at different rates. That has real impact for cities and how we think about growth, what growth is, what success is. Uh, I'm thrilled to be talking about that with Diana Lynn today. She's the author of Brave New Home. She's also the author of a Substack, A New Urban Order. Full disclosure, I'm the owner of the book. I'm a subscriber to the Substack, and I'm often a friend. Also, uh, Diane is a friend of mine. So full disclosure, Diana, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, Diana, uh, you, you're a longtime urbanist champion who I go to for a lot of um, chit-chatting on big topics, and this has been one you and I have been riffing on. Start with a foundation for folks who aren't all the way caught up. Why is it a problem that we think global population is expected to decline? Why could it be a problem? And why do why are we why are we here? Yeah, so I I, I would say I'm not 100 percent sure that it is a problem. I would say it's a fact that um, global population is going to start declining um, in the coming decades. So we've already seen that some major com uh, countries like China already are in decline. Their population's in decline. Europe is expected to be. Um, peaking uh, around 2025. Uh, other countries, Japan, South Korea, also seeing their populations decline. In the U.S., we are essentially not growing. Um, the census figures came out recently. It was a little bit more last year that we had um, a little bit more growth, but still less than a percent um, per, uh, population increase. And Essentially, all the growth is due to immigration, not natural increase at this point. So um, population decline is happening. And at the same time, also our population is uh, aging. And that's something that is happening really across the globe, except for in Africa, where there's still a very young population. And Africa is really the only continent that is expected to continue to um, keep growing past 2100. So um, it's going to be a really big change. And I think that we're pretty unprepared for it. So I think that's why it's a huge and important topic to really start thinking about. Agreed. And just to trot out what fears lack of population decline does offer. There is a sense that our entire economic language for modern history is built on more people, um, right. how we structure tax base and economic dynamism. We know that the kinds of, of um, breakthrough technologies often come from and happen at earlier stages of people's lives. Lots of signals that at least give us pause to understand what will this how will this change our economy and, and our local communities? I also, that's the kind of mm. structural one. There's an emotional one, though, too, that I tap into someone who's talks to economic development leaders, city leaders from, from cities across the country, because tech and innovation and entrepreneurship is seen as such a big harbinger of growth of the future. When I ask them about global population decline and then their own local relationship to it, they often fear that population decline signals defeat because most of our language in the 20th century has been when cities populations were declining, it meant bad news. And it mattered in the late 20th century when we started seeing an array of cities see their populations increase again. So is population decline a signal of defeat? Yeah, so I think it, it certainly can be. And certainly there is a history over the past, you know, half century where we've seen a lot of cities lose population and kind of start the urban doom loop where, you know, a loss of population means lack of tax um, revenue, which means reduced services, which mean reduced quality of life. And there's sort of just a bad downward spiral from there. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, and especially we can look to other cities that have actually seen their populations decline and still thrive nonetheless. So um, the example I love to give is in Paris, where uh, the city's population has actually been gradually declining over the past couple of years. Um, but no one would say Paris is a declining city. Um, in fact, I think a lot of people would say it's only gotten better and better over time. So um, Paris is a, you know, a good example of a type of place where 
you know, the, the metric of success is not necessarily the number of people who are living there, but what the quality of life is like in the city, um, what kind of economic activity is happening in the city, uh, what kind of um, uh, tourists it might be attracting and so on. Um, and I think that there, we can talk a little bit more about this, but there are kind of other examples where there are cities that haven't seen necessarily population growth, but have continued to sort of um, maintain a good quality of life. There's certainly lots of examples where, you know, you'll see a, a place like, say, for example, St. Louis. I happen to love St. Louis, um, but it has lost, I think, more than 50% uh, of its population yeah. its peak. Um, and, it, and the city hasn't really been able to kind of um, escape some of the kinds of, you know, the trappings that have happened with population decline, which have been, you know, that as people have left, there has been um, a decrease in investment. There has been more racial segregation. There has been um, um, issues of crime and abandonment. You know, all those kinds of um, things that kind of can come along with um, population loss can can really be a, a challenge for a city. And so, um, you know, that's certainly an example of where, yeah, it can really be a problem. You make me think that we just need to advance our vocabulary around the causes of population decline because we've so focused on one kind of population decline for so long there are these giant macro trends the global the national the, the mega regional level that that uh, the boomers around the rich world were enormous they're they're aging Millennials in the United States were a pretty big population, which is why we credibly cared about them in the 2010s. But we mostly moved where we were going to move. And now that millennial dividend of a big population is set. Mm -hmm. The Gen Z generation is a lot smaller in the United States. Folks have been moving south and southwest for mm -hmm. decades now. So like, a lot of these big factors have shifted where people are happening, but our language has tended to only stay stuck around the idea of people are fleeing cities for the suburbs because that's what we were talking about in 1950. I, I hear you noting that we need nuance. It, if, if people are fleeing your city because you have a lot of problems, that needs to be addressed regardless right. of population decline. But if your birth rate is falling like the rest of the rich world and you, you are making your city the best it can be, that's a slightly different conversation. I guess that's what you're kind of saying. They might yes. be different than Paris versus the St. Louis. Is that a fair? Right, exactly. And I would say um, another example of a city where you, we've seen population decline recently. So there was a ton of hype around Miami during the pandemic. Um, but Miami-Dade County has actually lost population since 2020. And so, um, you know, you can look at Miami, there are cranes in the sky everywhere. Uh, there is a ton of economic activity happening there. There are, you know, the tech sector is growing in Miami. Um, all of, you know, all of the kind of like energy and economic activity in the city is really not dependent on the fact that there are the number of people who are there. Um, and so I think that the what really needs to happen, like you're saying, is sort of there needs to be nuance and a kind of decoupling from the idea that um, growth is only um, the only language uh, population growth is the only kind of metric that we're going to be tracking here. Um, I think that, you know, the other issue is that cities across the country really need to start facing up to the fact that, you know, population decline or stasis is really going to be the norm for most cities over the coming um, decades. So certainly like a win might be actually a stable population, not necessarily even losing population. Um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, there may be some winners over the coming decades of cities that are going to see lots um, more people moving to them. But the truth is that like most, as I was saying earlier, most of the population growth is happening through immigration. We're seeing record lows of people actually relocating. So the fact that you're that actually attracting people is kind of increasingly unlikely. Yeah. So cities really need to kind of like start reframing A, how they're thinking about um, their own sort of metrics of success and B, really start planning for the idea that uh, their population isn't necessarily going to grow, but they're going to instead grow 
in different ways. They're going to try to become, you know, number one in a particular economic sector, or they're going to really radically improve their city for residents, or they're going to really try to attract tourists. These are all various other different kind of strategies for growth that don't necessarily rely upon um, just more people. The, one of the criticisms that this conversation gets is, is cities have seen some of their wealth inequality metrics grow because cities have have at times in the United States been like really fabulous for rich folks and mm. folks who have very few options are very unable to leave. And so some of that middle has been where the departures have come from. Mm -hmm. um, but that is admittedly like part of the older form of this narrative of, oh, you just left to the suburbs. Like that is that is very much a 20th mm -hmm. century mindset of what population decline is. So I guess I'm just like, I would love your push on, I imagine we can't, we're not going to get rid of that narrative. We ought not. We need to understand why our middle-class residents in many cities still seeing suburbs as, as different options. Maybe not. Maybe we just think of original yeah. mindset. Just, just unpack some of that. Yeah. For me. I, I definitely think we need to move beyond necessarily like thinking about how to just retain the middle class. Actually, I would vote for how to make your city as attractive as possible to immigrants because that's where the population growth is. And that's actually where immigrants um, have a propensity to have um, uh, more children and your natural increase in your city is going to be higher. Um, so I would really kind of focus on how to make your city a place where immigrants can um, tap into economic opportunity, create new businesses, grow their families. That would be the way for a city and like, that you know that that I think is going to be the key for um, a lot of population growth in the future, and I think that's also part of why you might end up seeing um, you know cities, let's just say in Texas, that are kind of like more amenable to immigrant communities growing and building um, uh, their lives there. That might also account for some of their their population increase. I want to touch on immigration there uh, before I have to turn to a final question before I lose you. Uh, we do not expect shrinking populations to happen evenly. We already know it won't because as you alluded to earlier, you know, a Japanese birth rate, very, very different than a Nigerian one. We're already seeing like vast differences even within the rich world, but certainly across the world. And it's going to happen at the city and regional level too, we think. And the United States is in some sense an outlier in the rich world in many ways, but one of them is we still do command the attention of immigrants or would be immigrants around the world. Um, that won't last forever because we expect mm. global population decline to reach all of the world over time, we think, we assume. But you're right, we have like a, we have some time here in the United States that other rich countries don't, or other countries don't, um, that we have a, a, a robust immigration. So I guess I'm curious, taking that big idea of we have some some time with immigrant inflows if we remain interested mm -hmm. in engaging our immigrant friends um do you would you give different advice to different cities or regions who also might have very different growth rates we already have cities with very different growth rates you alluded to texas um even some you cities have seen growth where others are already declining would you give different advice to different city leaders about how to approach this should you still be growing in some cities and accepting decline in others I think that you, I would say, prepare for population shifts. That would be mm. like my my goal. You know, like stop thinking about necessarily how to have having unrealistic expectations about growing your population, and instead think start thinking about what would we, how would we take advantage of a population loss? In fact, how could that possibly be an asset? I mean, one of the things that I think. You know, living in Philadelphia, we have had this tortured relationship with the vacant lots that have been left behind by our population loss since the 1950s. But in the future, actually, those vacant lots might end up being tremendous assets in different ways. They're, um, you know, as we approach things like urban heat island effect, for example, having actually a resource of nature in our cities, embedded in our cities, might end up being actually kind of an advantage that we hadn't thought of before. So thinking about, like, there could potentially be some advantages here for cities with having, um, you know, some some you know slow population loss and kind of like how can we 
how can we take advantage of that? That would be my advice. Start thinking about that. The, I got to go, but maybe a, a final word. I'm, I, I, I feel stuck that I think it, it's unlikely in the near term that a, a, a mayor, a city leader, an economic development strategist could confidently stand up at a, at a podium and say, our population is declining. It's going to continue to decline. And that's an opportunity. Um, mm. But I wonder if either you think I'm wrong or, or could you help set a more inspiring vision for how you could say that to a population without terrifying everyone? Like, I think someone would make a comparison of if I set up as the CEO of a company and said, our revenue is shrinking and it's an opportunity. Well, is and it is it actually shrinking is the question. I mean, that's the whole key. So your population may be declining, but is the revenue actually shrinking? Are you finding other ways to um, to generate revenue rather than just resident led taxes? Is it could it be that your city is more attractive to tourists? Could it be that the um, businesses in your city are generating significant amounts of um, revenue and that that is propelling your economy? Could it be that um, you have, and, and I would say finally, I mean, there are a ton of cities that ha aren't necessarily fast growing ones that are still doing, you know, incredibly well. Uh, and whether they're, you know, in the US or abroad in Europe, I don't think that it's, I think it's really that I wouldn't expect a mayor to get on the podium and talk about population decline. In fact, I would, I would want them to, um, have that be something that they are thinking about as an administration, not necessarily it's like a policy platform. Mm. Dana Lind, we're at time. I put you okay. go. Thank you. Dana Lind, author of Brave New World and Brave New Home. Upstairs. Brave New Home, sorry, Brave New Home. <laughs> not all this upstairs. Not, 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 not. <laughs> Diana's quite prominent in my mind, but I, fair enough. Not at LDS quite yet. Author of Brave New Home uh, and the Substack, A New Urban Order. We'll drop links after the video. Thanks so much for being here, Diana. Thank you. This was yeah, fun. Everybody. See ya. Okay, bye.